converting my CNC plasma cutter to a CNC wood router and cutting some of my first signs. I've been spending the last two and a half years trying to convert my garage into more of a shop and get the crown jewel of my garage installed, uh, which was a CNC plasma cutter. And I've been having a great time with it, uh, doing projects, learning how the software works, uh, working on more and more complex designs. And in this age of coronavirus and murder hornets, uh, I decided it would be a good time to um, convert my plasma table over to a CNC wood routing table. In starting that journey, the first thing that I really needed to do was to drain the water table. The water table sits under the cutting surface on my CNC plasma table and collects all the dust, all the debris, all the burning embers, all the dead insects, which has been accumulating really over the past nine months, which is pretty gross. So uh, my first job was to clean that up, make sure um, the, the motors and the bearings were in good shape. What you have to do for this table to uh, convert it from a plasma table to a CNC router is you have to remove these slats. I was then provided with two cross members. Uh, these cross members would then allow me to attach a spoil board. And why is it called a spoil board? Well, you need something to be able to kind of attach the uh, product that you're gonna cut. Your wood router is gonna come down and go below the product that the item that you're cutting so you can actually pull it out afterwards. So you need to have a board uh, to support it down there and that's where the spoil board comes into play. Uh, then I needed to address the uh, head of the gantry. Uh, I went ahead and removed the CNC plasma torch uh, strapped to the top and then attached a mounting plate uh, that held the brackets that allowed me to attach wood router to it and voila, I was kind of in business but not really and you'll see what I mean. First of all, when I went ahead and put the two cross members in, there was not enough support uh, between the two to really make sure that spoil board set flat. And it's really important to have a flat spoil board. Why is that? Well, you see your spoil board is what supports the material that you're gonna be cutting. So what you end up having is pieces that are not completely cut and separated. Uh, in order to remedy this, I ended up fabbing up uh, with my welder a third support beam that I went ahead and put into the middle. I tapped it for a couple screws uh, and those screws allowed me to elevate and decrease the height. This helped a lot to flatten out the board. Uh, after that, I got a flat router bit, which I then ran on the entire table to kind of skim the spoil board uh, and try to get it as flat as possible. With the spoil board mostly flat, it was time to get to cutting. I started out slow with some basic shapes like names and stars. I know I didn't have the proper feed rate and speed of the router bit, but I found some online resources and that helped me out and I just started slow and ramped it up over time as I got comfortable with it. Once I got that dialed in, however, I ran into a really irritating problem. So let me show you what I've got. After doing some uh, initial trial cutting, I just made an absolute mess. I have no kind of dust mitigation going on and it just got a layer of dust all over everything. So I started putting together or trying to put together some um, sort of sawdust mitigation system and I've got some pieces coming in the mail because if I'm going to cut consistently uh, I'm not I, I mean this is going to take me two hours to clean out this entire garage. I ended up buying some parts and I'm going to show you what I, I kind of decided I was going to put together. For the shroud that they gave me with this kit um, it's really it honestly it's kind of it, it's kind of chintzy I mean the the frame is good but if you look at the skirt it's not going to it's not going to keep dust from kind of shooting out uh, the bottom of it. You can buy these um, shroud uh, brushes, I guess you would call them. And I should be able to use that and replace the shroud down below with this. Next problem, this is a two and a half inch duct. And that's a two inch hole. I looked at all sorts of different connections and adapters and reducers and transducers and all the deucers. And I, it was just going to be kind of a hodgepodge to try to get something put together that would actually reduce it down to two inches. You just held on with some spot welds this two and a half inch. I'm going to go ahead and cut those off and I bought a two inch vent. With the two inch in here, the uh, diameter of this is going to be the same as the diameter of the bucket over there. And I also picked up some of this flexible sawdust hose. So this will fit here. The uh, hose should be able, it's 20 feet, it should be able to stretch up and over and then down. That should get me in business and really cut down on a lot of the dust issues I've been having. First thing was to cut off the two and a half inch vent. 
The Dremel literally wasn't cutting it, so I pulled out my big mama grinder and lopped off the top. Then I drilled some mounting holes for the two inch vent to screw into. Let's give that a go, huh? With the new two inch port screwed on, it was now time to address the dust collection skirt. she is. Not too shabby. Oh, well, that's a problem. There you go. I went ahead and I took the 20 foot end and threw it over the top. I've gone ahead and loaded up a um, file that I'm going to cut, so I'm going to go ahead and fire this up. Whoop, got it turn this one. Okay, so let's see what we've got. I would call this a partial success. When I would run this without the shroud, I'd have dust all over this machine. What this mostly did is it seemed to pick up a lot of the fine particulates that would get sprayed everywhere. But overall, I'm happy with uh, kind of how this worked and I've got very minimal uh, cleanup compared to what I had before. Now I posted some of my initial test cuts to Instagram and was contacted by a friend of mine who coaches golf at the local high school. He asked me if I could make him 20 plaques to give to his students at the end of the year. I was excited for this new challenge, so I took on the project. The first thing to do was to get his artwork into Adobe Illustrator and convert it into a black and white image. I then began the process of cleaning it up and making adjustments that would make it easier to machine. This was going to be a multi-layer sign in order to give it a 3D effect, so I needed to create a backing that all the elements would be glued to. I did this by creating an oval the same size as the original artwork and combining it with the golf club surround. This created my base that I could then glue everything to once it was painted. I then began nesting the parts together. Nesting is a process of laying multiple parts out in a pattern that allows you to maximize the amount of substrate that you're cutting out of. After that was finished, I ran the artwork through a couple more pieces of software that prepared it for the CNC routing process, and then I was good to go. All right, so I think we're in business. I pulled out uh, some of the samples, and uh, this is how they are looking. It seems to have cut through pretty cleanly. And um, there's a little chatter on these because these were kind of below the, the cutting point, but all of them seem to be cut out. All right, so I ran the job last night. I think 99% of it cut out well. Um, I think my spoil board's a little high on this side, so it didn't quite get the tabs in and I lost a couple of the surrounds. But by and large, no sawdust or very little sawdust, just that there and some that spilled off the edge so I would say at least on MDF it seems to be picking up a lot of the a lot of the dust so that is good news now the challenge is to try to pull all these items out I got to separate all the tabs with a chisel so that's a lot of chisel work so I'm gonna get to chiseling so over the past four nights or so, uh, I've just set up my router to go ahead and cut out all the parts I need for these signs. Uh, but now the real work begins because you see all these parts, they've all got these holding tabs that need to be knocked off with the chisel. And there needs to be a little bit of sanding work on the cuts just to make sure that they look really nice. <laughs> It's this. It's a lot and a lot of this. Now, as part of the process in getting ready to put this together, I decided to kind of put together a prototype. Um, and I'm, I'm pretty happy at kind of how, how it turned out. A little bit of finessing that I need to do and kind of tweaking to get the parts to fit in here. But if you start doing the math, 15 pieces times 20 signs, 
that's a lot of hand assembly that's required. So one of the things I'm gonna to need to do is try to figure out if I can make a template, uh, at least to get some of the letters better aligned to speed up this process. First things first though, I had a lot of painting to do. Just a little tip, if you're spray painting some small parts that would blow away from the wind of the, uh, or the exhalation, I guess you would say, of the um, spray paint, uh, you take a little bit of masking tape and you fold it over on itself and you stick the pieces to it, and then that way they won't blow away. Now it was time to make a template that would help speed up the assembly process. I decided to focus on the letters as I thought they'd be the hardest to align. I needed a template that would allow me to accurately place the letters on the sign base, but not bind either so that I could easily remove it after the letters were glued down. I did this through using the Shape Builder tool in Illustrator and some trimming to remove the tops of the letters, which gave me something that I thought would work pretty well, so I cut it out. Uh, so I created this template, as you can see, kind of the bottom of it. This would fit perfectly, uh, this would allow the letters, rather, to fit perfectly into the bottom of this sign. So essentially I just line this up uh, on each sign and I'm able to place the, the letters in there. The one problem that I ran into when I made this template, however, you'll, as you'll see here in a minute, is that um, the letters do not fit snugly because of the rounded corners of um, uh, the template. And so what I had to do is create another one um, which you can see here, and I did uh, little cutaways in the corners, or little divots rather, um, so that the uh, letters can actually fit um, snugly against the um, bottom of the template, and then they will not be out, uh, out of alignment. So next up is kind of doing that process and starting to uh, glue some of the letters up. Okay, so now here I am at final assembly and I can show you kind of how I'm putting these together. I've got the letters and the black surrounds. The first thing I need to do is kind of go ahead and drop drop the glue. I do that first and then uh, I grab my letter template. Then I'm gonna use a couple of clamps to go ahead and drop those on the ground with the glue. Uh, and then I get the other one and I just, I drop it too, just to make sure. Uh, then I'm gonna clip it on in place. Not with a lot of tension, but just a little bit. And then I'm gonna go ahead and start placing, placing letters. And uh, then we go ahead and we glow in the uh, top and bottom. This is fun, this takes a really thin line of glue. Drop it down, make sure you push nice and firm on that. And then we do the bottom piece. It's got a little bit more meat to kind of adhere the glue to. And then we just line this up and... And then that's really step one. The next step is to uh, do, really drop in the, the red in there, but I'm gonna do that afterwards. I'm gonna let this all dry up, but that's pretty much it. With this project, I just found it easier to glue all the black pieces down first, let them dry, and then come in afterwards and apply the red G pieces. That way I didn't run the risk of nudging some of the newly glued down black pieces and getting them out of position. Ha, so I did it, I'm finished. Uh, I got the job done. I got all uh, 20 of the plaques uh, painted and got a picture hanger on the back and I'm ready to go ahead and pack them up for delivery. Uh, so I wanted to give you kind of some takeaways if you're working on your first CNC wood project um, on just what I experienced, some of the pitfalls and some of the timing. So about five to 10% of it was actually working with the, uh, the graphics and kind of adjusting that so it could be cut out on a, a CNC machine. 20% um, of that was actually cutting out the parts that went into the plaques. Now, um, this was a little fuzzy because you can set up the machine to go ahead and run and cut and you just need to check on it every so often. You can do other projects around your garage, you can go inside for a few minutes. Uh, you just wanna be kind of careful to make sure that a tip, a router tip doesn't break or it gets stuck and starts setting things on fire. In, in terms of the most amount of time and what was the most surprising to me was actually the sanding and the finishing, uh, cutting off the tabs, the holding tabs. Uh, and just sanding the edges um, and getting rid of some of the fuzz on the edges so that the paint went laid down really well on the uh, different pieces. I had no idea the amount of handwork 
uh, that was gonna go into um, the amount of work by hand that you needed to do on these parts to actually get them to accept the paint well and just make sure they look really, uh, really nice at the end of the day. Uh, also, when you're um, knocking off the tabs, having tabs that are uh, about the right size for your chisel or whatever multi-tool you're gonna be using to cutting them out. I know it sounds like a, a little thing, like having to move the chisel twice, but when you're doing that hundreds of times, the time the time actually adds up really quick, and that's something that surprised me on this on this job. Um, the other thing is having the right sanding tools, uh, and I'll show you just what I mean. I would highly recommend getting a sanding block, uh, even though these cost a couple dollars. Uh, the amount of time it'll save you from having to change the paper out on these is huge, especially if you're going to do a ton of sanding. Um, you don't think about that until about halfway through the project. Just invest in the right tools and it'll save you a ton of time. Then we move on. Once you got everything sanded, comes uh, the painting. And that took about 20% uh, of the time to, to do the painting. And painting was like machining a little bit. You don't have to sit there the entire time. Uh, you spray a coat on, you can go and do something, do something else. Uh, and then last but not least is final uh, assembly. So final assembly, I would say, you know, gluing all the pieces on took about 10% of uh, the time of the entire project. Now I want to kind of move on to things that I learned or little tips that might help you if you're doing your first uh, CNC project. Number one is that it's actually, hold on. I want to redo the numbering. One means two and two means three. Uh, okay. So the first important uh, part of doing your own CNC project, uh, I think is take the time to prep and machine as much of the project as you can. That could be pre-drilling holes on the table, programming that into, um, your table to do that for you. I thought I was wasting a ton of time making a fixture uh, that I could use to kind of put the letters onto the sign, uh, but I realized that each unit of time that I spent doing that fixture saved me about two to three when I actually came to gluing up the, the project. Number two, uh, make about 10% more of the parts uh, than you need for the project. Maybe a, a tab was placed incorrectly, uh, and you have a part that has a nick in it. If you make about 10% over the amount of parts that you need, it gives you a few extra that you can kind of pull from. Additionally, it allows you to do some experimentation when it comes to doing your painting. I'd done a fair amount of spray painting before and had a good idea about how the paint was gonna lay down, but I didn't know entirely, and having a few extra pieces allowed me to do some experimentation to get the best results. Number uh, three, don't be in a rush. I'm lucky because we're in the midst of COVID, it's August and um, my client for these really doesn't need them until December when sports kind of start up again. So that gave me some flexibility and gave me some timing and didn't make me feel rushed. Uh, the last thing you wanna do is to be pulling items off of paint, um, applying glue to it and then pressing it down to only find that you've put fingerprints in the finish because the spray paint isn't fully cured. Ask me how I know. Number four, uh, and a, a big one I would say is make sure you're optimizing job times. I went ahead and I painted a group of parts. I put it out there, I uh, sprayed it. Then I came back in and I started sanding and um, getting the next parts ready for uh, the paint process. So by the time I was done to that, um, the paint had dried enough in my painting area that I could move that off to another drying area and I kind of got a flow going. So just wrapping things up, uh, this project took about three times the amount um, of time that I thought it was going to, uh, but it was really fun. I learned a, a tremendous amount and doing a project like this has given me the confidence to take on other projects that might have more pieces, more parts. I hope this has been helpful for you. If you have any recommendations, if I did anything wrong, or um, maybe you've worked on projects and have some tips for me, I'd love to see those in the comments. That's it. Um, I'm gonna pack these up, put them in a box, and get them to my customer and work on the next project. So hope you guys uh, have, have a great day.